Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to the beginning of our study of In Search of the Miraculous where every week we will read through and work through every chapter in turn and as I've said before I encourage any questions that you might have that come up from the study and there's in all of Uspensky's books each chapter has its sort of table of contents so it tells us what we're going to encounter in the chapter. So before I begin, I will just give um, yeah, the contents of the chapter, what we're going to come across, and then I'll say a few words about that, and then we'll get right into the chapter itself. Um, and as always, if you're enjoying the book club content, be sure to subscribe and share the show. And there's many ways you can support in the description, but right now I will just share the contents of chapter one and what we can expect to find in this chapter. So we have Return from India, the war and the search of the miraculous, old thoughts, the question of schools, plans for thir further travels, the Eastern Europe, a notice in a Moscow newspaper, lectures on India, the meeting with G, a distinguished man, the first talk, G's opinion on schools, G's group, Glimpses of Truth, Further Meetings and Talks, The Organisation of G's Moscow Group, The Question of Payment and the Means of the Work, The Question of Secrecy and the Obligations Accepted by the Pupils, A Talk About the East, Philosophy, Theory and Practice, How Was the System Found, G's Ideas, Man is a Machine Governed by External Influences, Everything Happens, Nobody Does Anything, In Order to Do It Is Necessary to Be, a man is responsible for his action, a machine is not responsible. Is psychology necessary for the study of machines? The promise of facts, can wars be stopped? A talk about the planets and the moon as living beings, the intelligence of the sun and the earth, subjective and objective art. So a lot to come in this opening chapter, but it's very biographical. Chapter 1 is a very biographical chapter where... Ospensky just lets us know where he is in his current state in life, what he's been up to, where he is, and he's arrived back in Russia, and then he meets Mr. Gurdjieff, and hello there, Sammy Smith. Um, Sammy, uh, be sure to check out my post about um, the Discord um, server if you're interested in that, but and we can discuss Gurdjieff more deeply, but yes, let's get right into... Chapter 1, like I say, is um, quite biographical, but we do come to some of the ideas from Gurdjieff towards the latter part of the chapter. So, this is In Search of the Miraculous, Chapter 1. I returned to Russia in November 1914, that is, at the beginning of the First World War, after a rather long journey through Egypt, Ceylon and India. The war had found me in Colombo, and from there I went back through England. When leaving Petersburg at the start of my journey, I had said that I was going to seek the miraculous. The miraculous is very difficult to define, but for me this word had quite a definite meaning. I had come to the conclusion a long time ago that there was no escape from the labyrinth of contradictions in which we live, except by an entirely new road, unlike anything hitherto known or used by us. But where this new or forgotten road began I was unable to say. I already knew then, as an undoubted fact, that beyond the thin film of false reality there existed another reality from which, for some reason, something separated us. The miraculous was a penetration into this unknown reality, and it seemed to me that the way to the unknown could be found in the East. Why in the East? It was difficult to answer this. In this idea there was, perhaps, something of romance, but it may have been the absolute real conviction that, in any case, nothing could be found in Europe. On the return journey and during the several weeks I spent in London, everything I had thought about the results of my search was thrown into confusion by the wild absurdity of the war and by all the emotions which filled the air, conversation and newspapers, and which, against my will, often affected me. 
But when I returned to Russia and again experienced all those thoughts with which I had gone away, I felt that my search and everything connected with it was more important than anything that was happening or could happen in a world of obvious absurdities. I said to myself then that the war must be looked upon as one of those generally catastrophic conditions of life in the midst of which we have to live and work and seek answers to our questions and doubts. The war, the great European war, in the possibility of which I had not wanted to believe and the reality of which I did not for a long time wish to acknowledge, had become a fact. We were in it and I saw that it must be taken as a great memento mori, showing that hurry was necessary and that it was impossible to believe in life, which led nowhere. The war could not touch me personally at any rate, not until the final catastrophe which seemed to me inevitable for Russia, and perhaps for the whole of Europe, but not yet imminent. Though then, of course, the approaching catastrophe looked only temporary, and no one had as yet conceived all the disintegration and destruction, both inner and outer, in which we should have to live in the future. Summing up the total of my impressions of the East, and particularly of India, I had to admit that, on my return, my problem seemed even more difficult and complicated than on my departure. India and the East had not only not lost their glamour of the miraculous, on the contrary, this glamour had acquired new shades that were absent from it before. I saw clearly that something could be found there which had long since ceased to exist in Europe, and I considered that the direction I had taken was the right one. But at the same time I was convinced that the secret was better and more deeply hidden than I could previously have supposed. When I went away I already knew I was going to look for a school or schools, I had arrived at this long ago. I realised that personal, individual efforts were insufficient and that it was necessary to come into touch with the real and living thought which must be in existence somewhere, but with which we had lost contact. This I understood, but the idea of schools itself changed very much during my travels and in one way became simpler and more concrete and in another way became more cold and distant. I want to say that schools lost much of their fairy tale character. On my departure, I still admitted much that was fantastic in relation to schools. Admitted is perhaps too strong a word. I should say better that I dreamed about the possibility of a non physical contact with schools, a contact, so to speak, on another plane. I could not explain it clearly, but it seemed to me that even the beginning of contact with a school may have a miraculous nature. I imagine, for example, the possibility of making contact with schools of the distant past, with schools of Pythagoras, with schools of Egypt, with the schools of those who built Notre Dame, and so on. It seemed to me that the barriers of time and space should disappear on making such contact. The idea of schools in itself was fantastic, and nothing seemed to me too fantastic in relation to this idea and I saw no contradiction between these ideas and my attempts to find schools in India. It seemed to me that it was precisely in India that it would be possible to establish some kind of contact which would afterwards become permanent and independent out of any outside interferences. On the return voyage, after a whole series of meetings and impressions, the idea of schools became much more real and tangible, and lost its fantastic character. This probably took place chiefly because, as I then realised, school required not only a search, but selection or choice, I mean on our side. That schools existed I did not doubt, but at the same time I became convinced that the schools I heard about, and with which I could have come into contact, were not for me. They were schools of either a frankly religious nature or of a half-religious character, but definitely devotional in tone. These schools did not attract me, chiefly because if I had been seeking a religious way, I could have found it in Russia. Other schools were of a slightly sentimental, mor moral philosophical type, with a shade of asceticism, like the schools of the disciples or followers of Ramakrishna. There were nice people connected with these schools, but I did not feel they had real knowledge. Others, which are usually described as yogi schools, and which are based on the creation of trance states, had, in my eyes, something of the nature of spiritualism. I could not trust them. 
all their achievements were either self-deception or what the orthodox mystics, I mean in Russian monastic literature, call beauty or allurement. There was another type of school with which I was unable to make contact and of which I only heard. These schools promised very much, but they also demanded very much. They demanded everything at once. It would have been necessary to stay in India and give up thoughts of returning to Europe to renounce all my own ideas, aims and plans and proceed along a road of which I could know nothing beforehand. These schools interested me very much and the people who had been in touch with them and who told me about them stood out distinctly from the common type but still it seemed to me that there ought to be schools of a more rational kind and that a man had the right up to a certain point to know where he was going. Simultaneously with this I came to the conclusion that whatever the name of the school, occult, esoteric or yogi, they should exist on the ordinary earthly plane like any other kind of school, a school of painting, a school of dancing, a school of medicine. I realised that thought of schools on another plane was simply a sign of weakness, of dream taking the pla- dreams taking the place of real search, and I understood then that these dreams were one of the principal obstacles on our possible way to the miraculous. On the way to India I made plans for further travels. This time I wanted to begin with the Mohammedan East, chiefly Russia, Central Asia and Persia, but nothing of this was destined to materialise. From London, through Norway, Sweden and Finland, I arrived in Petersburg, already named Petrograd and full of speculation and patriotism. Soon afterwards I went to Moscow and began editorial work for the newspaper to which I had written from India. I stayed there about six weeks, but during that time a little episode occurred which was connected with many things that happened later. One day, in the office of the newspaper, I found, while preparing for the next issue, a notice in, I think, the voice of Moscow, referring to the scenario of a ballet, the struggle of the magicians, which belonged, as it said, to a certain Hindu. The action of the ballet was to take place in Indian, in India and give a complete picture of oriental magic, including fakir miracles, sacred dances and so on. I did not like the excessively jaunty tone of the paragraph, but as Hindu writers of ballet scenarios were, to a certain extent, rare in Moscow, I cut it out and put it into my paper, with the slight addition that there would be everything in the ballet that cannot be found in real India, but which travellers go there to see. Soon after this, for various reasons, I left the paper and went to Petersburg. There, in February and March 1915, I gave public lectures on my travels in India. The titles of these lectures were In Search of the Miraculous and The Problems of Death. In these lectures, which were to serve as an introduction to my book on my travels, it was my intention to write, I said that in India the miraculous was not sought where it ought to be sought, that all ordinary ways were useless, and that India guarded her secrets better than many people supposed but that the miraculous did exist there and was indicated by many things which people passed by without realising their hidden sense and meaning or without knowing how to approach them. I again had schools in mind. In spite of the war and my lectures, in spite of the war my lectures evoked very considerable interest. There were more than a thousand people at each in the Alexandrovsky Hall of Petersburg town Duma, I received many letters, people came to see me and I felt that on the basis of a search for the miraculous it would be possible to unite together a very large number of people who were no longer able to swallow the customary forms of lying and living in lying. After Easter I went to give these lectures in Moscow. Among people whom I met during these lectures there were two, one a musician and the other a sculptor, who very soon began to speak to me about a group in Moscow which was engaged in various occult investigations and experiments and directed by a certain G, a Caucasian Greek, the very Hindu, so I understood, to whom belonged the ballet scenario mentioned in the newspaper I had come across three or four months before this. I must confess that what these two people told me about this group and what took place in it 
all sorts of self-suggested wonders, interested me very little. I had heard tales exactly like this many times before, and I had formed a definite opinion concerning them. Ladies who suddenly see eyes in their rooms which float in the air and fascinate them, and which they follow from street to street, and at the end arrive at the house of a certain Oriental to whom the eyes belong, or people who, in the presence of the same Oriental, suddenly feel he is looking right through them, seeing all their feelings, thoughts and desires, and they have a strange sensation in their legs and cannot move, and then fall into this power to such an extent that he can make them do everything he desires, even from a distance. All this and many other stories of the same sort had always seemed to me to be simply bad fiction. People invent miracles for themselves and invent exactly what is expected from them. It is a mixture of superstition, self-suggestion and effective thinking, and, according to my observation, these stories never appear without a certain collaboration on the part of the men to whom they refer. So that, in the light of my previous experience, it was only after the persistent efforts of one of my new acquaintances, M, that I agreed to meet G and have a talk with him. My first meeting with him entirely changed my opinion of him and of what I might expect from him. I remember this meeting very well. We arrived at a small café in a noisy, though not central, street. I saw a man of an oriental type, no longer young, with a black moustache and piercing eyes, who astonished me, first of all, because he seemed to be disguised and completely out of keeping with the place and its atmosphere. I was still full of impressions of the East, and this man with the face of an Indian Raja or an Arab sheikh who might once seem to see in a white burnous or a gilded turban, seated here in this little calf where small dealers and commission agents met together, in a black overcoat with a velvet collar and a black bowler hat, produced the strange, unexpected and almost alarming impression of a man poorly disguised, the sight of whom embarrasses you, because you see he is not what he pretends to be, and yet you have to speak and behave as though you did not see it. He spoke Russian incorrectly with a strong Caucasian accent, and this accent, with which we are accustomed to associate anything apart from the philosophical ideas, strengthened still further the strangeness and the unexpectedness of this impression. I do not remember how our talk began. I think we spoke of India, of esotericism and of yogi schools. I gathered that G had travelled widely and had been in places of which I had only heard and which I very much wished to visit. Not only did my questions not embarrass him, but it seemed to me that he put much more into each answer than I had asked for. I liked his manner of speaking, which was careful and precise. M soon left us. G told me of his work in Moscow. I did not fully understand him. It transpired from what he said that in his work, which was chiefly psychological in character, chemistry played a big part. Listening to him for the first time, I, of course, took his words literally. What you say, I said, reminds me of something I heard about a school in southern India. A Brahmin, an exceptional man in many respects, told a young Englishman in Travancore of a school which studied the chemistry of the human body, and by means of introducing or removing various substances, could change a man's moral and psychological nature. This is very much like what you are saying. It may be so, said G, but at the same time it may be quite different. There are schools which appear to make use of similar methods, but understand them quite differently. A similarity of methods or even of ideas proves nothing. There is another question that interests me very much, I said. There are substances which yogis take to induce certain states. Might these not be, in certain cases, narcotics? I have myself carried out a number of experiments in this direction, and everything I have read about magic proves to me quite clearly that all schools at all times and in all countries have made a very wide use of narcotics for the creation of those state, states which make magic possible. <clears throat> yes, said G. In many cases these substances are those which you call narcotics, but they can be used in entirely different ways. There are schools which make use of narcotics in the right way. People in these schools take them for self-study, in order to take a look ahead, to know their possibilities better, to see beforehand, in advance, what can be attained later on as the result of prolonged work. 
When a man sees this and is convinced that what he has learned theoretically really exists, he then works consciously, he knows where he is going. Sometimes this is the easiest way of being, convinced of the real existence of those possibilities which man often suspects in himself. There is a special chemistry relating to this. There are particular substances for each function. Each function can either be strengthened or weakened, awakened or put to sleep. But to do this, a great knowledge of the human machine and of this special chemistry is necessary. In all those schools which make use of this method, experiments are carried out only when they are really necessary and only under the direction of experienced and competent men who can foresee all results and adopt measures against possible undesirable consequences. The substances used in these schools are not merely narcotics, as you call them, although many of them are prepared from such drugs as opium, hashish and so on. Besides, schools in which such experiments are carried out, <clears throat> there are other schools which use these or similar substances not for experiment or study, but to attain definite desired results, if only for a short time. Hello, green grapes. <laughs> Through a skilful use of such substances, a man can be made very clever or very strong for a certain time. Afterwards, of course, he dies or goes mad, but this is not taken into consideration. Such schools also exist. So you see that we must speak very cautiously about schools. They may do practically the same things, but the results will be totally different. I was deeply interested in everything G said. I felt in some I felt in it some new points of view, unlike any I had met with before. He invited me to go with him to a house where some of his pupils were were to foregather. We took a carriage and went in the direction of Sokolniki. On the way G told me how the war had interfered with many of his plans. Many of his pupils had gone with the first mobilization. Very expensive apparatus and instruments ordered from abroad had been lost. Then he spoke of the heavy expenditure connected with his work, of the expensive apartments he had taken, and to which, I gathered, we were going. He said further that his work interested a number of well-known people in Moscow, professors and artists, and he expressed it, uh, as he expressed it. But when I asked him who precisely they were, he did not give me a single name. I ask, I said, because I am a native of Moscow, and besides, I have worked on newspapers here for ten years, so that I know more or less everybody. G said nothing to this. We came to a large empty flat over a municipal school, evidently belonging to teachers of this school. I think it was in the place of the former Red Pond. There were several of G's pupils in the flat, three or four young men and two ladies, both of whom looked like school mistresses. I had been in such flats before. Even the absence of furniture confirmed my idea, since municipal school mistresses were not given furniture. With this thought it somehow became strange to look at G. Why had he told me that tale about the enormous expenditure connected with this flat? In the first place the flat was not his. In the second place it was rent-free, and thirdly it could not have cost more than ten pounds a month. There was something so singular in this oblivious, bl obvious bluff that I thought at that time it must mean something. It is difficult for me to reconstruct the beginning of the conversation with G's pupils. Some of the things I heard surprised me. I tried to discover in what their work consisted, but they gave me no direct answers, insisting in some cases on a strange and, to me, unintelligible terminology. They suggested reading the beginning of a story written, so they told me, by one of G's pupils, who was not in Moscow at the time. Naturally, I agreed to this, and one of them began to read aloud from a manuscript. The author described his meeting and acquaintance with G. My attention was attracted by the fact that the story began with the author coming across the same notice of the ballet, The Struggle of the Magicians, which I myself had seen in the voice of Moscow in the winter. Further, this pleased me very much, because I expected it at the first meeting. The author certainly felt that G put him, as it were, on the palm of his hand, weighed him and put him back. The story was called Glimpses of Truth, and was evidently written by a man without any literary experience. 
but in spite of this it produced an impression, because it contained indications of a system in which I felt something very interesting, though I could neither name nor formulate it to myself, and some very strange and unexpected ideas about art, which found in me a very strong response. And if people are interested, I can read that passage or that um, part, The Glimpses of Truth, so let me know. I learned later on that the author of the story was an imaginary person and that the story had been begun by two of G's pupils who were present at the reading with the object of giving an exposition of his ideas in a literary form. Still later I heard that the idea of the story belonged to G himself. The reading of what constituted the first chapter stopped at this point. G listened attentively the whole time. He sat on a sofa with one leg tucked beneath him, drinking black coffee from a tumbler, smoking and sometimes glancing at me. I liked his movements, which had a great deal of a kind of feline grace and assurance. Even in his silence there was something which distinguished him from others. I felt that I would rather have met him not in Moscow, not in this flat, but in one of those places from which I had so recently returned, in the court of one of the Cairo mosques, in one of the ruined cities of Ceylon, or in one of the South Indian temples, Tanjore, Trichinopoly, or Madura. Well, how do you like the story? asked G, after a short silence when the reading had ended. I told him I had found it interesting to listen to, but that, from my point of view, it had the defect of not making clear what exactly it was all about. The story spoke of a very strong impression produced upon the author by a doctrine he had met with, but it gave no adequate idea of the doctrine itself. Those who were present began to argue with me, pointing out that I had missed the most important part of it. G himself said nothing. When I asked what was the system they were studying and what were its distinguishing features, I was answered very indefinitely. Then they spoke of work on oneself, but in what this work consisted they failed to explain. On the whole, my conversation with G's pupils did not go very well, and I felt something calculated and artificial in them, as though they were playing a part learned beforehand. Besides, the pupils did not match with the teacher. They all belonged to that particular layer of Moscow, rather poor intelligentsia, which I knew very well, and from which I could not expect anything interesting. I even thought that it was very strange to meet them on the way to the miraculous. At the same time, they all seemed to me quite nice and decent people. The stories I had heard from M obviously did not come from them, and did not refer to them. There is one thing I wanted to ask you, said G, after a pause. Could this article be published in a paper? We thought that we could acquaint the public in this way with our ideas. It is quite impossible, I said. This is not an article, that is, not anything having a beginning and an end. It is the beginning of a story, and it is too long for a newspaper. You see, we count material by lines. The reading occupied two hours. It is about three thousand lines. You know that we call, you know what we call a few leton in a paper. An ordinary few leton is about three hundred lines. So this part of the story will take ten fuletons. In Moscow papers, a fuleton with continuation is never printed more than once a week, so it will take ten weeks, and it is a conversation of one night. If it can be published, it is only in a monthly magazine, but I don't know any one suitable for this now, and in this case they will ask for the whole story before they say anything. G did not say anything, and the conversation stopped at that. But in G himself I at once felt something uncommon, and in the course of the evening this impression only strengthened. When I was taking leave of him the thought hashed into my mind that I must at once, without delay, arrange to meet him again, and that if I did not do so I might lose all connection with him. I asked him if I could not see him once more before my departure to Petersburg. He told me that he would be at the same calf the following day at the same time. I came out with one of the young men. I felt myself very strange, a long reading which I very little understood, 
people who did not answer my questions, G himself with his unusual manners and his influence on his people, which I all the time felt produced in me an unexpected desire to laugh, to shout, to sing, as though I had escaped from school or from some strange detention. I wanted to tell my impressions to this young man, make some jokes about G and about the rather tedious and pretentious story. I at once imagined myself telling all this to some of my friends. Happily, I stopped myself in time. But he will go and telephone them at once. They are all friends. So I tried to keep myself in hand and, quite silently, we came to the tram and rode towards the centre of Moscow. After rather a long journey, we arrived at Okhotny Nad, near which place I stayed, and silently said goodbye to one another, and parted. I was at the same calf where I had met G the next day, and the day following, and every day afterwards. During the week I spent in Moscow, I saw G every day. It soon became clear to me that he knew very much of what I wanted to know. Among other, among other things, he explained to me certain phenomena I had come across in India, which no one had been able to explain to me, either there, on the spot, or afterwards. In his explanations, I felt the assurance of a specialist, a very fine analysis of facts, and a system which I could not grasp, but the presence of which I already felt, because G's explanations made me think not only of the facts under discussion, but also of many other things I had observed or conjectured. I did not meet G's group again. About himself, G spoke but little. Once or twice he mentioned his travels in the East. I was interested to know where he had been, but this I was unable to make out exactly. In regard to his work in Moscow, G said that he had two groups unconnected with one another and occupied in different work, according to the state of their preparation and their powers, as he expressed it. Each member of these groups paid a thousand roubles a year and was able to work with him while pursuing his ordinary activities in life. I said that in my opinion a thousand rubles a year might be too large a payment for many people without private means. G replied that no other arrangement was possible because, owing to the very nature of the work, he could not have many pupils. At the same time he did not desire and ought not, he emphasised this, to spend his own money on the organisation of the work. His work was not and could not be of a charitable nature and his pupils themselves ought to find the means for the hire of apartments where they could meet, for carrying out experiments and so on. Besides this, he added that observation showed that people who were weak in life proved themselves weak in the work. There are several aspects of this idea, said G. The work of each person may involve expenses, travelling and so on. If his life is so badly organised that a thousand roubles embarrasses him, it would be better for him not to undertake this work. Suppose that, in the course of a year, his work requires him to go to Cairo or some other place. He must have the means to do so. Through our demand, we find out whether he is able to work with us or not. Besides, G continued, I have far too little spare time to be able to sacrifice it on others without being certain even that it will do them good. I value my time very much, because I need it for, um, for my own work, and because I cannot, and, as I said before, do not want to spend it unproductively. There is also another side to this, said G. People do not value a thing if they do not pay for it. I listened to this with a strange feeling. On the one hand, I was pleased with everything that G said. I was attracted by the absence of any element of sentimentality, of conventional talk about altruism, of words about working for the good of humanity and so forth. On the other hand, I was surprised at G's apparent desire to convince me of something in connection with the question of money, when I needed no convincing. If there was anything I did not agree with, it was simply that G would be able to collect enough money in the way he described. I realised that none of those pupils whom I had seen would be able to pay a thousand roubles a year, if he had really found in the East visible and tangible traces of hidden knowledge and was continuing investigations in this direction, then it was clear that this work needed funds, like any other scientific enterprise, like an expedition into some unknown part of the world, 
the excavation of an ancient city, or an investigation requiring elaborate and numinous physical or chemical experiments. It was quite unnecessary to convince me of this. <clears throat> On the contrary, the thought was already in my mind that if G gave me the possibility of a closer acquaintance with his activities, I should probably be able to find the funds necessary for him to place his work on a proper footing and also bring him more prepared people. But of course, I still had only a very vague idea in what this work might consist. Without saying it plainly, G gave me to understand that he would accept me as one of his pupils if I expressed the wish. I told him that the chief obstacle on my side was that, at the moment, I could not stay in Moscow because I had made an arrangement with a publisher in Petersburg and was preparing several books for publication. G told me that he sometimes went to Petersburg and he promised to come there soon and let me know of his arrival. But if I joined your group, I said to G, I should be faced with a very difficult problem. I do not know whether you exact a promise from your pupils to keep secret what they learn from you, but I could give no such promise. There have been two occasions in my life when I had the possibility of joining groups engaged in work which appears to be similar to yours, at any rate by description, and which interested me very much at the time but in both cases to join would have meant consenting or promising to keep secret about any everything that I might learn there, and I refused in both cases because, before everything else, I am a writer, and I desire to be absolutely free and to decide for myself what I shall write and what I shall not write. If I promise to keep secret something I am told, it would be very difficult afterwards to separate what had been told me from what came to my own mind, either in connection with it or even with no connection. For instance, I know very little about your ideas yet, but I do know that when we begin to talk, we shall very soon come to questions of time and space, of higher dimensions and so on. These are questions on which I have already been working for many years. I have no doubt, whatever, that they roused, that they, that they must occupy a large place in your system. G nodded. Well, you see, if we were now to talk under a pledge of secrecy, then, after the first conversation, I should not know what I could write and what I could not write. But what are your own ideas on the subject? said G. One must not talk too much. There are things which are said only for disciples. I could accept such a condition only temporarily, I said. Of course, it would be ludicrous if I began at once to write about what I learned from you, but if, in principle, you do not wish to make a secret of your ideas and care only that they should not be transmitted in a distorted form, then I could accept such a condition and wait until I had a better understanding of your teaching. I once came across a group of people who were engaged in various scientific experiments on a very wide scale. They made no secret of their work but they made it a condition that no one would have the right to speak of or describe any experiment unless he was able to carry it out himself. Until he was able to repeat the experiment himself, he had to keep silent. There could be no better formulation, said G, and you will keep such a rule, this and if you will keep such a rule, this question will never arise between us. Are there any conditions for joining your group, I asked, and is a man who joins it tied to it and to you? In other words, I want to know if he is free to go and leave your work, or does he take definite obligations upon himself, and how do you act towards him if he does not carry out his obligations? There are no conditions of any kind, said G, and there cannot be any. Our starting point is that man does not know himself, that he is not. He emphasised these words. That is, he is not what he can and what he should be. For this reason, he cannot make any agreements or assume any obligations. He can decide nothing in regard to the future. Today he is one person and tomorrow another. He is in no way bound to us, and if he likes, he can at any time leave the work and go. There are no obligations of any kind, either in our relationship to him or in his to us. If he likes, he can study. He will have to study for a long time and work a great deal on himself. When he has learned enough, then it is a different matter. We will see. He will see for himself whether he likes our work or not. If he wishes, he can work with us. If not, he may go away. 
Up to that moment he is free. If he stays after that, he will be able to decide or make arrangements for the future. For instance, take one point. A situation may arise, not of course in the beginning, but later on, when a man has to preserve secrecy, if only for a short for a time, about something he has learned. But can a man who does not know himself promise to keep a secret? Of course he can promise to do so, but can he keep his promise? For he is not one. There are many different people in him. One in him promises and believes that he wants to keep the secret, but tomorrow another in him will tell it to his wife or to a friend over a bottle of wine, or a clever man may question him in such a way that he himself will not notice that he is letting out everything. Finally, he may be hypnotized, or he may be shouted at unexpectedly and frightened, and he will do anything you like. What sort of obligations can he take upon himself? No, with such a man... We will not talk seriously. To be able to keep a secret, a man must know himself, and he must be. A man such as all men are is very far from this. Sometimes we make temporary conditions with people as a test. Usually they are broken very soon, but we never give any serious secret to a man we don't trust, so it does, no, so it does not matter much. I mean, it matters nothing to us, although it certainly breaks our connection with this man and he loses his chance to learn anything from us, if there is anything to learn from us. Also, it may affect his personal friends, although they may not expect it. I remember that in one of my talks with G during this first week of my acquaintance with him, I spoke of my intention of going again to the East. Is it worth thinking about it, and can I find out what I want there, I asked G. It is good to go for a rest, for a holiday, said G, but it is not worth going there for what you want. All that can be found here. I understood that he was speaking of work with him. But do not schools which are on the spot, so to speak, in the midst of all the traditions, offer certain advantages, I asked. In answering this question, G told me several things which I did not understand until later. Even if you found schools, you would find only philosophical schools, he said. In India, there are only philosophical schools. It was divided up in that way long ago. In India, there was philosophy in Egypt, theory, and in present-day Persia, Mesopotamia, and Turkestan, practice. And does it remain the same now, I asked? In part, even now, he said. But you do not clearly understand what I mean by philosophy, theory, and practice. These words must be understood in a different way, not in the way they are usually understood. But speaking of schools, there are only special schools. There are no general schools. Every teacher or guru is a specialist in some one thing. One is an astronomer, another a sculptor, a third a musician. And all the pupils of each teacher must first of all study the subject in which he has specialised, then afterwards another subject, and so on. It would take a thousand years to study everything. But how did you study? I was not alone. There were all kinds of specialists among us. Everyone studied on the lines of his particular subject. Afterwards, when we foregathered, we put together everything we had found. And where are your companions now? G was silent for a time, and then said slowly, looking into the distance, Some have died, some are working, some have gone into seclusion. This word from the monastic language, heard so unexpectedly, gave me a strange and uncomfortable feeling. At the same time, I felt a certain acting on G's part, as though he were deliberately trying from time to time to throw me a word that would interest me and make me think in a definite direction. When I tried to ask him more definitely where he had found what he knew, what the source of his knowledge was and how far this knowledge went, he did not give me a direct answer. You know, G said once, when you went to India, they wrote about your journey and your aims in the papers. I gave my pupils the task of reading your books, of determining by them what you were, and of establishing on this basis what you would be able to end. So we knew that you would end while you were still on your way there. With this, the talk came to an end. I once asked G about the ballet which had been mentioned in the papers and referred 
to, in the story, glimpses of truth, and whether this ballet would have the nature of a mystery play. My ballet is not a mystery, said G. The object I had in view was to produce an interesting and beautiful spectacle. Of course, there is a certain meaning hidden beneath the outward form, but I have not pursued the aim of exposing and emphasising this meaning. An important place in the ballet is occupied by certain dances. I will explain this to you briefly. Imagine that in the study of the movements of the heavenly bodies, let us say the planets of the solar system, a special mechanism is constructed to give a visual representation of the laws of these movements and to remind us of them. In this mechanism each planet, which is represented by a sphere of appropriate size, is placed at a certain distance from a central sphere representing the sun. This me the mechanism is set in motion and all the spheres begin to rotate and to move along prescribed paths, reproducing in a visual form the laws which govern the movements of the planets. This mechanism reminds you of all you know about the solar system. There is something like this in the rhythm of certain dances. In the strictly defined movements and combinations of the dances, certain laws are visually reproduced, which are intelligible to those who know them. Such dances are called sacred dances. In the course of my travels in the East, I have many times witnessed such dances being performed during sacred services in various ancient temples. Some of these dances are reproduced in the struggle of the magicians. Moreover, there are three ideas lying at the basis of the struggle of the magicians, but if I produce the ballet on the ordinary stage, the public will never understand these ideas. I understood from what he said subsequently that this would not be a ballet in the strict meaning of the word, but a series of dramatic and mimic scenes held together by a common plot, accompanied by music and intermixed with songs and dances. The most appropriate name for these scenes would be Revue, but without any comic element. The ballet or Revue was to be called The Struggle of the Magicians. The important scenes represented the schools of a black magician and a white magician, with exercises by pupils of both schools and a struggle between the two schools. The action was to take place against the background of the life of an eastern city, intermixed with sacred dances, dervish dances and various national eastern dances, all this interwoven with a love story which itself would have an allegorical meaning. I was particularly interested when G said that the same performers would have to act and dance in the white magician scene and in the black magician scene, and that they themselves and their movements had to be attractive and beautiful in the first scene and ugly and discordant in the second. You understand that in this way they will see and study all sides of themselves. Consequently, the ballet will be of immense importance for self-study, said G. I understood this far from clearly at the time, but I was struck by a certain discrepancy. In the notice I saw in the paper it was said that your ballet would be staged in Moscow and that certain well-known ballet dancers would take part in it. How do you reconcile this with the idea of self-study, I asked? They will not play and dance in order to study themselves. All this is far from being decided, said G, and the author of the notice you read was not fully informed. All this may be quite different, although, on the other hand, those taking part in the ballet will see themselves, will see themselves whether they like it, whether they like it or not. And who is writing the music, I asked. That also is not decided, said G. He did not say anything more, and I only came across the ballet again five years later. Once I was talking with G in Moscow. I was speaking about London, where I had been staying a short while before, about the terrifying mechanization that was being developed in the big European cities, and without which it was probably impossible to live and work in those immense whirling mechanical toys. People are turning into machines, I said, and no doubt sometimes they become perfect machines, but I do not believe they can think. If they try to think, they could not have been such fine machines. Yes, said G, that is true, but only partly true. It depends first of all on the question which mind they use for their work. 
If they use the proper mind, they will be able to think even better in the midst of all their work with machines, but again only if they think with the proper mind. I did not understand what G meant by proper mind and understood it only much later. And secondly, he continued, the mechanization you speak of is not at all dangerous. A man may be a man, he emphasized this word, while working with machines. There is another kind of mechanization which is much more dangerous, being a machine oneself. Have we ever thought about the fact that all peoples themselves are machines? Yes, I said. From the strictly scientific point of view, all people are machines governed by external influences. But the question is, can the scientific point of view be wholly accepted? Scientific or not scientific is all the same to me, said G. I want you to understand what I am saying. Look, all those people you see, he pointed along the street, are simply machines, nothing more. I think I understand what you mean, I said. And I have often thought how little there is in the world that can stand against this form of mechanization and choose its own path. This is just where you make your greatest mistake, said G. You think there is something that chooses its own path, something that can stand against mechanization. You think that not everything is equally mechanical. Why, of course not, I said. Art, poetry, thought are phenomena of quite a different order. Of exactly the same order, said G. These activities are just as mechanical as everything else. Men are machines and nothing but mechanical actions can be expected of machines. Very well, I said, but are there no people who are not machines? It may be that there are, said G. Only not those people you see, and you do not know them. That is what I want you to understand. I thought it rather strange that he should be so insistent on this point. What he said seemed to me obvious and incontestable. At the same time, I had never liked such short and all-embracing metaphors. They always omitted points of difference. I, on the other hand, had always maintained differences were the most important thing, and that in order to understand things it was first necessary to see the points in which they differed. So I felt that it was odd that G insisted on an idea which seemed to be obvious, provided it were not made too absolute, and exceptions were admitted. People are so unlike one another, I said. I do not think it would be possible to bring them all under the same heading. There are savages, there are mechanized people, there are intellectual people, there are geniuses. Quite right, said G. People are very unlike one another, but the real difference between people you do not know and cannot see. The difference of which you speak simply does not exist. This must be understood. All the people you see, all the people you know, all the people you may get to know, are machines. Actual machines working solely under the power of external influences. As you yourself said, machines they are born and machines they die. How do savages and intellectuals come into this? Even now, at this very moment, while we are talking, several millions of machines are trying to annihilate one another. What is the difference between them? Where are the savages and where are the intellectuals? They are all alike. But there is a possibility of ceasing to be a machine. It is of this we must think, and not about the different kinds of machines that exist. Of course, there are different machines. A motor car is a machine, a gramophone is a machine, and a gun is a machine. But what of it? It is the same thing. They are all machines. In connection with this conversation, I remember another. What is your opinion of modern psychology, I once asked G, with the intention of introducing the subject of psychoanalysis, which I had mistrusted from the time when it had first appeared. But G did not let me get as far as that. Before speaking of psychology, we must be clear to whom it refers and to whom it does not refer, he said. Psychology refers to people, to men, to human beings. What psychology he emphasized the word, can there be in relation to machines? Mechanics, not psychology, is necessary for the study of machines. That is why we begin with mechanics. Is it, a ver it is a very long way to it is a very long way yet to psychology. Can one stop being a machine? I asked. Ah, that is the question, said G. 
If you had asked such questions more often, we might, perhaps, have got somewhere in our talks. It is possible to stop being a machine, but for that it is necessary, first of all, to know the machine. A machine, a, re a real machine, does not know itself and cannot know itself. When a machine knows itself, it is then no longer a machine, at least not such a machine as it was before. It already begins to be responsible for its actions. This means, according to you, that a man is not responsible for his actions, I asked. A man, he emphasized this word, is responsible. A machine is not responsible. In the course of one of our talks, I asked G, what in your opinion is the best preparation for the study of your method? For instance, is it useful to study what is called occult or mystical literature? In saying this, I had in mind more particularly the tarot and the literature on the tarot, available on the channel, uh, Ospensky's interpretation of the major arcana cards, you can find the playlist. Yes, said G, a great deal can be found by reading, for instance, take yourself. You might already know a great deal if you knew how to read. I mean that, if you understood everything you have read in your life, you would already know what you are looking for now. If you understood everything you have written in your own book, what is it called? He made something altogether impossible out of the words tertium organum. I should come and bow down to you and beg you to teach me. But you do not understand either what you read or what you write. You do not even understand what the word understand means. Yet understanding is essential, and reading can be useful only if you understand what you read. But of course no book can give real preparation, so it is impossible to say which is better. What a man knows well, he emphasized the word well, that is his preparation. If a man knows how to make coffee well or how to make boots well, then it is already possible to talk to him. The trouble is, it's that nobody knows anything well. Everything is known just anyhow superficially. This was another of those unexpected turns which G gave to his explanations. G's words, in addition to their ordinary meaning, undoubtedly contained another, altogether different meaning. I had already begun to realize that, in order to arrive at this hidden meaning in G's words, one had to begin with their usual and simple meaning. G's words were always significant in their ordinary use, although this was not the whole of their significance. The wider or deeper significance remained hidden for a long time. There is another talk which has remained in my memory. I asked G what a man had to do to assimilate his teaching. What to do? asked G as though surprised. It is impossible to do anything. A man must first of all understand certain things. He has, a thou he has thousands of false ideas and false conceptions, chiefly about himself and he must get rid of some of them before beginning to acquire anything new. Otherwise the new will be built on a wrong foundation, and the result will be worse than before. How can one get rid of false ideas, I asked? We depend on the forms of our perception. False ideas are produced by the forms of our perception. G shook his head. Again you speak of something different, he said. You speak of errors arising from perceptions, but I am not speaking of these. Within the limits of given perceptions, man can err more or err less. As I have said before, man's chief delusion is his conviction that he can do. All people think that they can do, all people want to do, and the first question all people ask is what they are to do. But actually nobody does anything and nobody can do anything. This is the first thing that must be understood. Everything happens. All that befalls a man, all that is done by him, all that comes from him, all this happens. And it happens in exactly the same way as rain falls as a result of a change in the temperature in the high regions of the atmosphere or the surrounding clouds, as snow melts under the rays of the sun, as dust rises with the wind. Man is a machine. All his deeds, actions, words, thoughts, Feelings, convictions, opinions and habits are the results of external influences, external impressions. Out of himself a man cannot produce a single thought, a single action. Everything he says, does, thinks, feels, all this happens. Man cannot discover anything, invent anything. It all happens. 
but no one will ever believe you if you tell him he can do nothing. This is most offensive and the most unpleasant thing you can tell people. It is particularly unpleasant and offensive because it is the truth and nobody wants to know the truth. When you understand this, it will be easier for us to talk. But it is one thing to understand with the mind and another thing to feel it with one's whole mass, to be really convinced that it is so and never forget it. With this question of doing, G emphasized the word, yet another thing is connected. It always seems to people that others invariably do things wrongly, not in the way they should be done. Everybody always thinks he could do it better. They do not understand and do not want to understand that what is being done, and particularly what has already been done in one way, cannot be and could not have been done in any other way, or in another way. Have you noticed how everyone now is talking about the war? Everyone has his own plan, his own theory. Everyone finds that nothing is being done in the way it ought to be done. Actually, everything is being done in the only way it can be done. If one thing could be different, everything could be different, and then perhaps there would have been no war. You're welcome, Corrine. Welcome to the stream. Try to understand what I'm saying. Everything is dependent on everything else. Everything is connected. Nothing is separate. Therefore, everything is going in the only way it can go. If people were different, everything would be different. They are what they are, and so everything is as it as, is, as it is. This was very difficult to swallow. Is there, is there nothing, absolutely nothing, that can be done, I asked? Absolutely nothing. And can nobody do anything? That is another question. In order to do, it is necessary to be. And it is necessary first to understand that to be, what to be means. If we continue our talks, you will see that we use a special language and that, in order to talk with us, it is necessary to learn this language. It is not worthwhile taking in ordinary language, or sorry, it is not worthwhile talking in ordinary language because in that language it is impossible to understand one another. This also at the moment seems strange to you, but it is true. In order to understand it is necessary to learn another language. In the language which people speak they cannot understand one another. You will see later why this is so. Then one must learn to speak the truth. This also appears strange to you. You do not realize that one has to learn to speak the truth. It seems to you that it is enough to wish to, to wish or to decide to do so. And I tell you that people comparatively r rarely tell a deliberate lie. In most cases they think they speak the truth, and yet they lie all the time, both when they wish to lie and when they wish to speak the truth. They lie all the time, both to themselves and to others. Therefore nobody ever s understands either himself or anyone else. Think, could there be such discord, such deep misunderstanding and such hatred towards the views and opinions of others if people were able to understand one another? But they cannot understand because they cannot help lying. To speak the truth is the most difficult thing in the world and one must study a great deal and for a long time in order to be able to speak the truth. The wish alone is not enough. To speak the truth, one must know what the truth is and what a lie is, and first of all in oneself, and this nobody wants to know. Talks with G and the unexpected turn he gave to every idea interested me more and more every day, but I had to go to Petersburg. I remember my last talk with him. I had thanked him for the consideration he had given me and for his explanations which I already saw had changed many things for me. But all the same, you know, the most important thing is facts, I said. If I could see genuinely and real facts, genuine and real facts of a new and unknown character, only they would finally convince me that I am on the right way. I was again thinking of miracles. There will be facts, said G, I promise you, but many other things are necessary first. I did not understand this last word then, his last words then, I only understood them later when I really came up against facts, for G kept his words, but this was not until about a year and a half later, in 1916.
<clears throat> of the last talks in Moscow, there is still another which remains in my memory during which G said several things which again became intelligible only subsequently. He was talking about a man I had met while with him, and he spoke of his relations with certain people. He is a weak man, said G. People take advantage of him, unconsciously of course, and all because he considers them. If he did not consider them, everything would be different, and they themselves would be different. It seemed odd to me that a man should not consider others. What do you mean by the word consider, I asked. I both understand you and do not understand you. This word has a great many different meanings. Precisely the contrary, said G. There is only one meaning. Try to think about this. Later on I understood what G called considering and realised what an enormous place it occupies in life and how much it gives rise to. G called considering that attitude which creates inner slavery, inner dependence. Afterwards we had occasion to speak a great deal about this. I remember another talk about the war. We were sitting in the Filipov's cafe on the Tv Tverskaya. It was very full of people and very noisy. War and profiteering had created an unpleasant, feverish atmosphere. I had even refused to go there. G insisted, and, I, as, and as always with him I gave way. I had already realised by then that he sometimes purposely created difficult conditions for conversations, as though demanding of me some sort of extra effort and a readiness to reconcile myself to unpleasant and uncomfortable surroundings for the sake of talking with him. But this time the result was not particularly brilliant, because, owing to the noise, the most interesting part of what he was saying failed to reach me. At first I understood what G was saying, but the thread gradually began to slip away from me. <clears throat> After several attempts to follow his remarks, of which only isolated words reached me, I gave up listening and simply observed how he spoke. This conversation began with my question, Can war be stopped? And G answered, Yes, it can. And yet I had been certain from previous talks that he would answer, No, it cannot. But the whole thing is how, he said. It is necessary to know a great deal in order to understand that. What is war? It is the result of planetary influences. Somewhere up there, two or three planets have approached too near to each other. Tension results. Have you noticed how, if a man passes quite close to you on a narrow pavement, you become all tense? The same tension takes place between planets. For them it lasts perhaps a second or two. But here on the earth, People begin to slaughter one another, and they go on slaughtering maybe for several years. It seems to them at the time that they hate one another, or perhaps that they have to slaughter each other for some exalted purpose, or that they must defend somebody or something, and that it is a very noble thing to do, or something else of the same kind. They fail to realise to what an extent they are mere pawns in the game. They think they signify something. They think they can move about as they like, they think they can decide to do this or that, but in reality their movements, all their actions, are the result of planetary influences, and they themselves signify literally nothing. Then the moon plays a big part in this, but we will speak about the moon separately, only it must be understood that neither Emperor Wilhelm, nor generals, nor ministers, nor parliaments signify anything or can do anything. Everything that happens on a big scale is governed from outside, and governed either by accidental combinations of influences or by general cosmic laws. This was all I heard. Only much later I understood what he wished to tell me, that is, how accidental influences could be diverted or transformed into something relatively harmless. It was really an interesting idea referring to the esoteric meaning of sacrifices, but in any case, at the present time, this idea has only an historical and a psychological value. What was really important, and what he said quite casually, so that I did not even notice it at once, and only remembered later in trying to reconstruct the conversation, was his words referring to the difference of time for the planets and for man. And even when I remembered it, for a long time I did not realise the full meaning of this idea. Later, very much was based on it. Somewhere about this time I was very much struck by a talk about the sun, the planets and the moon. 
I do not remember how this talk began, but I remember that G drew a small diagram and tried to explain what he called the correlation of forces in different worlds. This was in connection with the previous talk, that is, in connection with the influences acting on humanity. The idea was roughly this. Humanity, or more correctly, organic life on earth, is acted upon simultaneously by influences proceeding from various sources and different worlds. Influences from the planets, influences from the moon, influences from the sun, influences from the stars. All these influences act simultaneously. One influence predominates at one moment and another influence at another moment. And for man there is a certain possibility of making a choice of influences, in other words, in passing from one influence to another. To explain how would need a very long talk, said G, so we will talk about this some other time. At this moment I want you to understand one thing. It is impossible to become free from one influence without becoming subject to another. The whole thing, all work on oneself, consists in choosing the influence to which you wish to subject yourself and actually falling under this influence, and for this it is necessary to know beforehand which influence is the more profitable. What interested me in this talk was that G spoke of the planets and the moon as living beings, having definite ages, a definite period of life and possibilities of development and transition to other planes of being. From what he said it appeared that the moon was not a dead planet as is usually accepted, but on the contrary a planet in birth a planet at the very initial stages of its development which had not yet reached the degree of intelligence possessed by the earth, as he expressed it. But the moon is growing and developing, said G, and some time it will possibly, it will possibly, attain the same level as the earth. Then near it a new moon will appear, and the earth will become their sun. At one time the sun was like the earth, and the earth like the moon, and earlier still the sun was like the moon. This attracted my attention at once. Nothing had ever seemed to me more artificial, unreliable and dogmatic than all the usual theories of the origin of planets and solar systems, beginning with the Kant Laplace theory down to the very latest, with all their additions and variations. The general public considers these theories, or at any rate, the last one known to it, to be scientific and proven. But in actual fact there is of course nothing less scientific and less proven than these theories. Therefore the fact that G's system accepted an altogether different theory, an organic theory having its origin in, or in entirely new principles and showing a different universal order, appeared to me very interesting and important. In what relation does the intelligence of the earth stand to the intelligence of the sun, I asked. The intelligence of the sun is divine, said G. But the earth can become the same, only, of course, it is not guaranteed, and the earth may die, having attained nothing. Upon what does this depend, I asked. G's answer was very strange. There is a definite period, he said, for a certain thing to be done. If by a certain time what ought to be done has not been done, the earth may perish without having attained what it could have attained. Is this period known, I asked. It is known, said G but it would be no advantage whatever for people to know it. It would even be worse. Some would believe it, others would not believe it, yet others would demand proofs. Afterwards they would begin to break one another's heads. Everything ends this way with people. In Moscow at the same time we also had several interesting talks about art. These were connected with the story which was read on the first evening that I saw G. At the moment it is not yet clear to you G once said, that people living on earth can belong to very different levels, although in appearance they look exactly the same. Just as there are very different levels of men, so there are different levels of art. Only you do not realise at present that the difference between these levels is far greater than you might suppose. You take different things on one level far too near one another, and you also, and you think these different levels are accessible to you. I do not call art all that you call art, which is simply mechanical reproduction, imitation of nature or other people, or simply fantasy, or an attempt to be original. Real art is something quite different, or, sim 
Among works of art, especially work of ancient art, you meet with many things you cannot explain, and which contain a certain something you do not feel in modern works of art. But as you do not realise what this difference is, you very soon forget it, and continue to take everything as one kind of art. And yet there is an enormous difference between your art and the art of which I speak. In your art everything is subjective, the artist's perception of this or that sensation, the forms in which he tries to express his sensations and the perception of these forms by other people. In one and the same phenomenon, one artist may feel one thing and another artist quite a different thing. One and the same sunset may evoke a feeling of joy in one artist and sadness in another. Two artists may strive to express exactly the same perceptions by entirely different methods, in different forms or entirely different perceptions in the same forms, according to how they were taught, or contrary to it. And the spectators, listeners or readers will perceive not what the artist wished to convey or what he felt, but what the forms in which he expresses his sensations will make them feel by association. Everything is subjective and everything is accidental, that is to say, based on accidental associations. The impression of the artist and his creation, he emphasised the word creation, the perception of the spectators, listeners or readers. In real art there is nothing accidental, it is mathematics. Everything in it can be calculated, everything can be known beforehand. The artist knows and understands what he wants to convey and his work cannot produce one impression on one man and another impression on another. Presuming, of course, people on one level. It will always, and with mathematical certainty, produce one and the same impression. At the same time, the work of art will produce different impressions on people of different levels, and people of lower levels will never receive from it what people of higher levels receive. This is real objective art. Imagine some scientific work, a book on astronomy or chemistry. It is impossible that one person should understand it in one way and another in another way. Everyone who is sufficiently prepared and who is able to read this book will understand what the author means and precisely as the author means it. An objective work of art is just such a book, except that it affects the emotional and not, the in and not only the intellectual sides of man. Do such works of art exist at this present day, I asked. Of course they exist, answered G. The great Sphinx in Egypt is such a work of art, as well as some historically known works of architecture, certain statues of gods and many other things. There are figures of gods of various mythological beings that can be read like books, only not with the mind but with the emotions, provided they are sufficiently developed in the course of our development. In the course of our travels in Central Asia, we found in the desert, at the foothills of the Hindu Kush, a strange figure which we thought at first was some ancient god or devil. At first it produced upon, upon us simply the impression of being a curiosity. But after a while we began to feel that this figure contained many things, a big, complete and complex system of com cosmology. And slowly, step by step, we began to decipher this system. It was in the body of the figure, in its legs, in its arms, in its head, in its eyes, in its ears, everywhere. In the whole statue there was nothing accidental, nothing without meaning, and gradually we understood the aim of the people who built this statue. We began to feel their thoughts, their feelings. Some of us thought that we saw their faces, heard their voices. At all events, we grasped the meaning of what they wanted to convey to us across thousands of years, and not only the meaning, but all the feelings and the emotions connected with it as well. That indeed was art. I was very interested in what G said about art. His principle of the division of art into subjective and objective told me a great deal. I still did not understand everything he put into these words. I had always felt in a certain divisions in, in art certain divisions and gradations which I could neither define nor formulate, and which nobody else had formulated. Nevertheless, I knew these divisions and gradations existed, so that all discussions about art without the recognition of these divisions and gradations seemed to me empty and useless, 
simply arguments about words. In what G had said in his indications of the different levels which we failed to see and understand, I felt an approach to the very gradations that I had felt but could not define. In general, many things which G said astonished me. There were ideas which I could not accept and which appeared to me fantastic and without foundation. Other things, on the contrary, coincided strangely with what I had thought myself and with what I had arrived at long ago. I was most of all interested in the connectedness of everything he said. I already felt that his ideas were not detached one from another, as all philosophical and scientific ideas are, but made one whole, of which, as yet, I saw only some of the pieces. I thought about that in the night train, on the way from Moscow to Petersburg, I asked myself whether I had indeed found what I was looking for. Was it possible that G actually knew what had to be known in order pr to proceed from words or ideas to deeds, to facts? I was still not certain of anything, nor could I formulate anything precisely, but I had an inner conviction that something had already changed for me and that now everything would go differently. And that was chapter one of In Search of the Miraculous. Like I said, very biographical. Um, Ospensky bringing us up to date with his life and where he's been and his meeting and early interactions with Gurdjieff. And um, he says it there several times, and I think it's important to emphasize it early on. Um, but this only became clear later on. He says it at least three or four times in that beginning chapter. G, or Gurdjieff, would talk about something, and it only made sense later on. So throughout the course of the book, we continued to um, learn new ideas, new concepts, and what you'll find is they sort of, they all connect, like he says there on that final um passage I'll just read it again if you don't mind um, uh, other things on the contrary coincided strangely with what I had thought of myself and with what I had arrived at long ago I was most of all interested in the connectedness of everything he said I already felt that his ideas were not detached one from another as all philosophical and scientific ideas are but made one whole of which as yet I saw only some pieces and so, of course, we just read chapter one. I believe there's 18 chapters. And, of course, these are just the be beginning threads of certain concepts and ideas. And we're going to begin to start pulling on some of the threads as we progress through certain chapters. And then all of a sudden, you'll think, well, where does this thread go now? And then two or three chapters later you'll pick the thread up again and you'll think, oh yes, and then you can connect them together and it makes a lot more sense. And there's other things in the book as well that one must, like Gurdjieff says, you must have an experience, you must feel it with your whole mass, your whole being. So it's not enough just to um, know it intellectually with the mind, you almost have to feel it with the emotions and the body and, and the soul and the whole being. So that was chapter one. There was many interesting uh, things that come up in it. Let me know, guys, as I've said, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And I think I'm just going to do, uh, I've made some notes as I was working through the chapter and planning it out. So I think I've got a few videos lined up that I'll do just to discuss some of these, um, some of the ideas that are, that um maintain throughout the whole thread of the story and that it would be good to sort of speak a bit more about and share um Uspensky's q a from the fourth way and uh, maurice nicole um hello there a lumpy horse we uh we're just finishing up now but you can of course go back and start again and yeah have your philosophical fix for the evening And so, yes, there's not really much more to say at the moment because um, 
it's just the first chapter. We've been introduced to Ospensky and his life up to that point, and his opening mean, meeting, how he met Gurdjieff, and uh, the beginning conversations. Of course, um, just like anything, I'm sure you guys, when you first make a new acquaintance, whether it's a work colleague or a school friend, the first few hours or days, you're sort of feeling each other out, you know? What do you know about this? What do you think about it? Well, this is what I think about it. And then it's sort of just this dance to figure out if you are compatible, if you can be friends, if you can get along. And in this instance, of course, Gurdjieff is the the teacher in the capacity of a teacher. And I mentioned in one of the previous videos, Gurdjieff says there about when you was in India, I got my pupils to read Tershim Organum. And that is a book of Aspensky's that I read very early on and I haven't read it for many years. And yeah, it's pretty trippy because he's talking about time and dimensions and all these things, but very interesting stuff. And so, yes, that was chapter one. Again, any questions, I'll be happy to consider them. Otherwise, I'm just going to do a few, a few videos talking about some of those ideas and concepts. And we'll be back next Thursday for chapter two. And of course, all of these threads will start coming through and uh, yeah, we'll be able to start plaiting them together and uh, bringing them into our lives and our perceptions and our attitudes towards life. So yeah, for me, it's all very powerful stuff. And uh, for those of you who join me and who work through this and get through it, it's not, um, it's not entertainment. In Search for Miraculous, it's not entertainment. It's not, uh, you know, light bedtime reading like some of the storybooks we read. This is, uh, yeah, for me, serious philosophy so, and, and occult mysticism. So, yeah, if you've made it to this point and you're seeing this, well done. And, yeah, maybe it'll take two or three reads. And, again, questions are welcome and shares are also welcome. So if you want to share... In Search of the Miraculous Chapter 1 and you think people might be interested, like Gurdjieff says there, it's not for everyone. Everyone can't um, grasp this and can't or is not interested in, that's what I've found, people just aren't interested at all. But again, just like with anything um, on the channel here at Book Club, if you're not interested, you go watch something else, isn't it? YouTube's a, uh, a place with many things to watch. So, yes. But if you've got to this point, I s congratulate you. I say, yeah, you, you'll, you'll be ready for chapter two. And for now, it's lovely to see you all. Uh, Sunday night, we'll be reading another storybook. I'm not sure which yet, but we will read another storybook Sunday evening at eight. So I hope to see you there. And for now, take care, look after yourselves, and I'll see you soon. Take care, guys. See you.